Good morning, everybody, distinguished delegates. It's a great pleasure to open the ceremony that we have here for the first hour of the 12th session of the Working Group 1 of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Let me briefly introduce who is sitting with me on this podium. To my right is the Minister for the Environment of Sweden, Her Excellency Ms. Lena Ek. Welcome. Thank you. To my left is the co-chair of Working Group 1, Ching Dohe. Chandra Pachauri, the chair of IPCC and Renate Christ, the Secretary of the IPCC. Welcome, everybody. It's a great, great pleasure to be here in the city of Stockholm. And thank you very much to everybody who has worked so hard to welcome us here in this location. Thank you very much. We would like to start with the opening statement of my colleague, Professor Ching Dohe. Please, Dohe. Her Excellency, Ms. Linna Ek, the Minister of the Environment of Sweden. Dr. Rajinda Pacheri, the Chair of the IPCC. Dr. Renata Christ, the Secretary <laughs> of IPCC. The fellow scientists and the colleagues distinguished, distinguished delegates. Good morning. It is my great pleasure to join the, with Dr. Thomas Stock. Welcome you. On behalf of the IPCC Working Group 1, to its 12th session during which the IPCC Fifth Assessment Report, IR5, Climate Change 2013, the physical science basis, will be deliberated and approved. Let me take this opportunity to express my deepest respect to the re representative of the IPCC member countries and scientists who have been working Paris to present the scientific research findings on and the solution to climate change. At the same time, I also extend my gratitude to the representatives of the Swedish government as well as to TSU of Working Group 1 for their fruitful arrangements and the pre preparation for this meeting. Ladies and gentlemen, the scientific evidence of the anthropogenic climate change has strongly year on year, leaving few, few, fewer uncertainties about the serious consequences of erection. In spite of that, there remain knowledge gaps and uncertainties in some area of the climate sciences. As IPCC says, <clears throat> As IPCC assessment, assessment report incorporated the, the work of the best scientists in the world, collected the, <coughs> collected the latest advances and the research findings in the field of the climate change globally, and reflected the level of the understanding and the knowledge of the climate change in the international scientific community they have been used by the international community and the national governments as a major scientific basis in formulating policies and taking measures and actions in response to climate change. Since 2007, when the IPCC released its fourth assessment report, Working Group 1, the physical science components of the climate change has been the substantial development in the many fronts and the international communities earliest. Look forward to the launch of the fifth assessment report. These colleagues were met by highly 
motivated the excellent lead author team of the working group one, which worked constructively and effectively over the past five years. Ladies and gentlemen, as a co-chair from a developing country, I'm very, very pleased in the more and more experts from the developing country and the countries with the economy transition can be able to participate in the IPCC RFI Working Group 1 and others pay more attention to seeking the research findings and the literatures from the developing and the now English speaking countries in the assessment report. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, I'm looking forward to working together with you in the coming four days to deliberate and approve the SPM line by line, during which government delegates will propose the future changes to the text. CRS and the invite the lead authors will assist the working group one co-chairs in ensuring that the SPM text remains scientific consistent with the underlying report. I believe all delegates and my colleagues will work in a scientific, professional, objective, consistent, reaching, and transparent manner. In close, I would like to thank all of scientists, authors, and the contributors to this report. In particular, the colleagues of the Working Group One committee, community for their dedicated work on the climate change science. Finally, I would like to acknowledge the effective and the collaborative work carried out by the TSU Working Group One, without which this effort couldn't have been managed and brought the successful completion. I wish this session a complete success and wish you all stay in uh, Stockholm happy. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dahe. I'd like to join you, Her Excellency, Ms. Lena Ek, Minister of the Environment of Sweden, Dr. Rajendra Pachari, Chair of the IPCC, Dr. Renata Christ, Secretary of the IPCC, fellow scientists and colleagues, distinguished delegates from 110 countries. Ladies and gentlemen, since a few months, news about climate change has surfaced again in the media after some considerable time of relative silence. Some of these news reports surprised me because their messages contrast so much with the latest published results in the scientific literature and with the assessment that the IPCC Working Group 1 team of scientists has carried out during the past five years. Ladies and gentlemen, we are not here to discuss what we have, may have heard or read in the news recently about climate change and the role of human activity. We are here to open the 12th session of the IPCC Working Group 1 and to bring to completion the assessment of the physical science basis of climate change that has started five years ago. In 2008, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change decided to initiate its fifth assessment cycle during which a report is to be prepared. This report shall assess on a comprehensive, objective, open and transparent basis the scientific, technical and socio-economic information relevant to understanding the scientific basis of risk of human-induced climate change. On behalf of my fellow co-chair Ching Da He and indeed of the entire team of scientists and authors of this report and the technical support unit of Working Group 1 and the IPC Secretariat, we are excited and proud to finally meet here in Stockholm and to 
successfully complete the process for which we have all worked so hard. This report is now delivered to you, the policymakers from 110 countries. Since 2010, the author team has produced a succession of draft reports, which were thoroughly reviewed by experts and governments. Multiple stage reviews have collected a staggering number of 54,677 comments, which were all considered by the author team. Ladies and gentlemen, I know of no other document that has undergone this scrutiny and that has involved so many critical people who offered their insight and advice. This is what makes this report so unique. It stands out as a reliable and indispensable source of knowledge about climate change. This knowledge is based on millions of measurements in the atmosphere, in the ocean, on land, and ice, and from space. These measurements permit an unprecedented and unbiased view of the state of the climate system. Millions of billions of bytes of numerical data from the form the foundation of a physically consistent projection of a range of possible futures of climate. In today's digital world, information can be produced by anyone distributed by anyone, read by anyone worldwide. We experience and appreciate seemingly instant information about anything. At such speed, quality is a rare commodity. It is more than ever evident that both convictions and doubts can be produced and widely spread almost on a daily basis. Ladies and gentlemen, this is precisely why we need rigorous and robust assessments such as this one. Climate change is one of the greatest challenges of our time, as the governments have declared in the Cancun agreements in 2001. Because this change threatens our primary resources, land and water, in short, because it threatens our only home, we must face this challenge. It requires the best information for the most effective decisions. Who else than scientists could create and provide the robust knowledge about climate change that contributes to the basis for such decisions? The members of the Working Group One author team are scientists who know how to collaborate, but they are also competitors, competitors for funding, for good ideas, and for brilliant students. Yet in spite of their competition, each scientist in this report, who was involved in this report, was ready to donate her time and scientific expertise towards to work towards the common goal of assembling the first contribution to the IPCC's fifth assessment report. Such professional generosity and persistence are rare today, and I want to explicitly acknowledge that at this occasion. In order to make the complex scientific material more accessible to the users of the report, the 14 chapters with more than 1,140,000 words and 1,250 scientific diagrams were distilled into a technical summary and then condensed by a factor of 80 relative to the underlying report into a concise summary for policymakers. I can assure you all that in this process of distillation, we have followed the sage advice that is attributed to Albert Einstein. Make it as simple as possible, but no simpler. An essential component of every IPCC assessment since the first report in 1990 is climate change projections. The best way to project, to predict the future is to shape it, said Willy Brandt, the eminent German politician and winner of the Nobel Peace Prize in 1971. But then, what guides us in shaping our future? 
Which futures are possible given the available options? The consequences of possible choices on the Earth's climate system are assessed in this report. Science provides a well-tested framework, not to predict, but to estimate the future. This framework rests on three pillars, observations, understanding Earth system processes, and climate models simulations. Ladies and gentlemen, our assessment shows that we do have a choice in shaping our future. Scenarios that have assumed determined interventions and strong mitigation offer a chance of keeping global mean warming under 1.5 degrees Celsius. On the other hand, scenarios that envisage continued carbon dioxide emissions or postponed reductions of these emissions indicate that options of limiting global warming to 2 degrees Celsius may become unattainable. The choice to shape the future is ours, and fortunately we are not left to make blind choices, to cast a dice or enjoy ignorance. Regular IPCC assessment ensure that the basis for informed decisions remain scientific, robust, and up-to-date. Ladies and gentlemen, this unparalleled effort was only possible owing to three elements that I have learned to appreciate during my four years of service as co-chair of working with one of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. First, wisely crafted and formulated procedures of the IPCC, sufficiently precise but not overly prescriptive. Second, an extremely engaged scientific community, and third, the will to find consensus or to be explicit where such a consensus cannot be reached. Before I close, I wish to express my sincerest thanks to the government of Sweden and the national IPCC focal point, or Dr. Marianne Liljeskog, to the government of Switzerland and the University of Bern for funding and hosting the Working Group One Technical Support Unit, to the IPC Secretariat for the overall organization of the fifth assessment report cycle of the IPCC, to the Working Group One Bureau and our team of scientists. On behalf of Working Group One, we are all looking forward to completing the task that you have given to us four years ago. It is our collective assignment to produce a summary for policymakers that presents the findings in the clearest possible manner in a document with no compromises to scientific accuracy. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I would now like to invite Dr. Rajendra Pachari, Chair of the IPCC. Please, Pachi. Your Excellency, Dame Lena Ek, Minister of Environment Government of Sweden, my colleagues, Vice Chairs of the IPCC, Dr. Chin Daho and Dr. Thomas Stocker, Co-Chairs of Working Group One, Dr. Renate Christ, Secretary of the IPCC, Dr. Haldor Thorgarsson from the Secretariat of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, authors of the Working Group One report, distinguished delegates, members of the media, and friends. It is a great honor and privilege for me to be here at the opening of this 12th session of Working Group One of the IPCC, during which the IPCC will consider the Working Group One contribution to the fifth assessment report covering the physical science basis. Let me take the opportunity on behalf of the IPCC to express my deep gratitude to the government of Sweden for hosting this session in the beautiful city of Stockholm and to welcome the authors of the report and all the distinguished delegates who are present at this meeting. Stockholm ushered in a new era in human consciousness in 1972 with the UN conference on the human environment, where incidentally climate change did receive some attention, but clearly 
our knowledge on the subject at that stage was neither as strong nor as widespread as it is today. This working group one session will approve the summary for policy makers and accept the full report. This is happening at a time when the world is awaiting the outcome of this session with great expectation because of its obvious significance in respect of the current status of global negotiations and the ongoing debate on actions to deal with the challenge of climate change. As you're aware, the last comprehensive assessment report of the IPCC, the AR4, was published in 2007. The world therefore values the release of the most up-to-date, unbiased, comprehensive, and scientific information contained in the AR5 so that we can be fully informed about climate change and about the choices we have before us in dealing with the projections of climate change that this report would provide us. Indeed, as Dr. Thomas Stocker has reminded us, in the words of the great statesman Willie Brandt, that to deal with projections of the future, the best thing to do is to shape the future. There are justifiable expectations that the AR5 will be an outstanding, scientifically robust, policy relevant, and informative report, which will go far beyond pre previous assessments. And we are here to meet these expectations. This meeting marks an extremely important phase in the history of the IPCC and the panel's activities, as we are in the middle of the review being undertaken by the governments which are part of the UN FCCC. I would like to commend the co-chairs, the author, authors, and the TSU of Working Group 1 for giving us this landmark achievement. In the quarter century of IPCC's existence, a progression of knowledge has been provided by this unique enterprise involving the governments of the world and the best scientific talent that is available on this planet. The work of the IPCC and the AR4 in particular have already created a deep level of awareness worldwide on various aspects of climate change and the scientific realities associated with it. Since then, the two special reports brought out in 2011 have provided a wealth of information and knowledge on renewable energy sources and their relevance to mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions and extreme events and disasters as a result of climate change, along with the means by which we can advance adaptation to deal with them. The IPCC also saw from the experience with these two special reports the effectiveness of outreach efforts. And of course, information dissemination was greatly assisted by efforts undertaken by many to spread the findings of recent IPCC reports to every section of human society on the globe. But I believe that this meeting marks a new milestone in the understanding of climate change. The draft Working Group 1 report, of course, addresses topics such as temperature change and sea level rise, but this time it is also focused in depth on several other features whose relevance has increased over time. Since IPCC's work, by definition, is required to be policy relevant, the findings of the Working Group report would give us a better understanding of a vital element of the global commons, the implications for the availability and health of key resources like land and water and their sustainable management, which are fundamental basic aspects of life on this planet. Land and water affect every form of life, and they in turn would be affected by climate change. Working group two and three will provide us with knowledge related to the costs and implications of inaction and details of options available to us for action. This would be in keeping with the UN General Assembly resolution endorsing the establishment of the IPCC in 1988, which mandated the IPCC in its assessment reports to cover, and I quote, realistic response strategies, end of quote. While assessment of those strategies will come largely from the contributions of working group two and three, the essential foundations of that understanding and key knowledge on the rationale for action, as well as the implications for inaction, come out of this report. Such an exercise in producing a comprehensive and robust scientific assessment would not have been possible without the dedicated leadership 
of the working group co-chairs, my two colleagues to the right, and I take this opportunity to compliment and thank them. I would also like to express my gratitude to the hundreds of authors who have worked tirelessly and with great determination to ensure that the needs of the AR5 are fully met. I would like to remind you of how gratified we were to receive such an enthusiastic response from the scientific community worldwide when we were forming the author teams of the AR5, which went beyond in magnitude and skill the precedents that we had set with earlier reports. It is of significance to recall that 60% of the authors selected for the AR5 were new to the IPCC process, and this is a very important feature that the world must know because it shows the inclusivity and openness of the IPCC for drawing in talent from all quarters and the emphasis we place on new knowledge and expertise and fresh perspectives and approaches. We are also indebted to the member governments of the IPCC who support the entire process of the IPCC and have provided guidance, direction and review comments so valuable for the contents of the AR5 and endorse the work of the scientific community. Having been associated with four of the five assessment reports of the IPCC, first as a lead author for working groups two and three in the second assessment report, as vice chair in the third assessment report, and as chair in the AR4 and AR5, I can say that the strength of the IPCC lies in harnessing of scientific talent under the umbrella of the 195 member governments. This ensures the incorporation of valuable insights on policy relevant issues that provide the usefulness in the contents of the IPCC reports. It is notable that a unique organization such as the IPCC through which science and its policy relevance are bound together has been able to attain a level of scientific credibility and policy relevance among decision makers and the public all over the world largely on account of our structural characteristics and operational processes. What are the next steps? We have come a long way since the AR5 scoping meeting in Venice in 2009. We've also learned from experience. In 2010, in response to a heightened level of public scrutiny, the Secretary General of the UN and I requested the Inter-Academy Council to conduct an independent review of the IPCC processes and procedures in order to strengthen the capacity of the IPCC to respond to future challenges and to ensure the ongoing quality of its reports. I'm proud to say today that all of IAC's recommendations in terms of management and governance, processes and procedures, communications and conflict of interest have been implemented, with one exception which was not feasible for practical reasons. I would also like to highlight in this regard the rapid efforts made by the panel to give practical shape and substance to the recommendations of the IAC. In 2011, the IPCC approved two special reports on renewable energy sources and climate change mitigation and, an extreme, and on extreme events and disasters and advancing climate change adaptation, of which the relevance continues to grow today. The task force on inventories was very active in responding to the invitation of the UN FCCC to develop supplementary guidance on wetlands and completed its work in early 2013. Now the release of the Working Group 1 contribution to the AR5 is the first of three substantive reports that combined will cover all aspects of climate change and will reach culmination in just over 12 months. Working Group 2's contribution to the AR5 on impacts, adaptation and vulnerability will be approved by the panel in March 2014. Working Group 3's contribution to the AR5 on mitigation of climate change will be approved in April 2014 and the synthesis report in October 2014. Now it is crucial that we ensure that the findings of the AR5 are disseminated with determined efforts to reach every part of the globe. We should also expect diverse reactions to the report, given the heightened scrutiny and interest that we are now subject to. But we will continue to provide assessments that are robust, objective, and scientifically valid. To 
produced within systems of transparency and openness. My final words would be a message to the governments. The findings of the AR5 will provide the scientific basis on which governments will be able to consider different options and solutions to climate change within the ongoing UNFCCC process. And I hope that informed, enlightened, and forward-looking policymaking will actively use scientific assessments produced by the IPCC. The approval of the Working Group 1 contribution to the AR5 sets the stage for a positive outcome in the UNFCCC negotiations. And I will hope that this and subsequent AR5 reports will facilitate the parties of the Convention in coming up with an agreement that all countries can embrace by 2015. In this context, it is crucial that the findings of the Working Group 1 report are presented effectively to the upcoming 19th Conference of the parties of the UNFCCC in Warsaw, Poland. May I once again thank our Swedish hosts and the local organizing committee for their work in helping with this meeting. I would also like to thank my senior colleagues at the IPCC and the staff of the Secretariat, who have as always risen to the occasion and played a major role not merely in helping in the organization of this meeting, but also facilitating the smooth completion of the WG reports. Thank, thank you to all the distinguished delegates and the authors who have made it here, and I wish you a very productive and successful meeting. My final thanks to Her Excellency the Minister for favoring us with her presence. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Pachari, for your words. We would now invite a video message that has been recorded. Uh, it is delivered by the Secretary General of the World Meteorological Organization, Mr. Michel Charot. Can we have this video, please? Excellency, Madame Lunaik, Minister for the Environment of Sweden, Dr. Pachori, Chairman of RPCC, Professor Stoker and Dr. Chin Dahe, co-chairs of Working Group 1, Mrs. China, Executive Director of UNEP, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the World Meteorological Organization, I'm very pleased to offer some remarks at the opening of this 12th session of Working Group 1. First of all, I would like to congratulate the co-chairs and all the authors of Working Group 1 for their great accomplishment. I would also like to express my gratitude to Dr. Pachori for his support to your work. The release of the first block of the fifth assessment report, the physical science basis, has been awaited with great anticipation, and it represents a true step forward. Since the fourth assessment report, the scientific knowledge derived from observation, theoretical evidence, modeling has continued to increase. This improved knowledge has further confirmed that human activities are indeed the primary driver in climate change and made even more compelling the need for mitigation and adaptation action. The global network of scientists and experts that contribute to the IPCC has played a critical role in such scientific advancements. The WMO is proud to co-sponsor IPCC together with UNEP. The foresight of our two organizations led to the establishment of the panel in 1988. Its assessment reports will be essential to the definition of a climate agreement by 2015. As a draft report of Working Group 1 illustrates, the degree of confidence in the finding of the assessment has grown since the fourth assessment report. Today, few will dispute the important changes observed in the climate system over more than half a century. The temperature of the atmosphere and the ocean has increased. The ice sheets and glaciers of the world have diminished, and the global mean sea level has risen. But the last decades have also been characterized by a high frequency of extreme weather events, heat waves, heavy rain and floods, drought, tropical and extratropical storms. Further assessments and projections are needed to assess how much can be attributed to human activities. This reaffirms once more the importance of IPCC and the need for its continuity. But these changes have today direct impacts on our most vulnerable societies, 
and remind us that climate action, in particular adaptation, cannot be further postponed. It is therefore particularly welcome that the fifth assessment report pays special attention to the regional scale, with greater emphasis on the socio-economic aspects of climate change and their implications for sustainable development. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, these are new elements in your assessment report that are of particular interest to WMO and its programs. In particular, the treatment of key climate phenomena like monsoons and El Nino, and the impact on regional climate change, and to end assessments of sea level change and the carbon cycle, as well as an atlas of global and regional climate projections to facilitate access for users. In particular, the Global Framework for Climate Services launch during the Third World Climate Conference in 2009 will certainly benefit from the results of the report, in particular for the definition of climate scenario, climate products and services at the regional and sub-regional scale. In conclusion, I would like to reiterate that at WMO we look forward to continuing our deep interaction with you together with our co-sponsor UNEP. I wish to thank once again all those who have contributed to this draft report most of them belonging to the WMO community. It is thanks to their dedication and your hard work that the policy makers of today and of tomorrow will have a sound scientific base on which to take climate action. Thank you. Thank you very much. This message is followed by a video message by, delivered by Mr. Achim Steiner, the Executive Director of the United Nations Environment Programme. Please. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, it is with great pleasure that I join you on this occasion which marks the beginning of the IPCC's Working Group 1 approval session for the fifth assessment report and also the beginning of a cycle of reports that will be released by the IPCC over the coming months. The World Meteorological Organization and the United Nations Environment Program have been companions to the IPCC from its beginning. Indeed, its formation and also the hosting of the Secretariat has been a task that we have fulfilled both with great pride and also with great discipline committed to the principles and also the independence of the IPCC in trying to fulfill its mandate to help the world understand better a phenomenon that will transform our lives, our economies and indeed the way our planet will function in the future. The work of the IPCC over the years has focused on the interface between science and what governments, decision makers, policy makers and societies can draw as conclusions from that science. We have also been part of this journey of trying to address a phenomenon that we still do not fully comprehend, nor can we document all its detailed consequences on our planet. We also know that imperfect knowledge is never a reason not to act, particularly when we now have over the years consolidated our understanding both of the phenomenon of global warming and in particular the consequences that will arise from it for the future of our economies and societies. The interface between science and policy is at the heart also of the mandate and the mission of the United Nations Environment Program when it was established in 1972 by the world's nations. Indeed the Rio Plus 20 summit has reaffirmed the importance of having an environmental authority in the international system. And it is through that perspective that we continue to commit our support as the United Nations Environment Programme to the immensely important task of the IPCC. The science policy interface is also what will enable us to draw both conclusions and derive solutions and options for action. And it is here that I believe the IPCC can take great solace and heart also from the fact that yes, while the science continues to be evolved and our understanding continues to be deepened, we today have the foundations for addressing what is perhaps the greatest driver of transformation in the 21st century, be it in our economies, in our energy systems, in our transport systems, the urban centers where half of the world's population today live. We are in the midst of trying to understand how the footprint of civilization and also of the industrial revolution and of a global economy of 7 billion people is demanding new responses, new technologies and new management approaches to trying to make our presence on this planet sustainable. I want to commend the IPCC and in particular the scientists who once again have committed to both the task, the mandate 
and the principles that underpin the work of the IPCC and will provide the world with the best possible understanding of what we know today and also what we do not yet know. The physical science basis is indeed the foundation upon which all other parts of the work both of the IPCC and also the work that under the United Nations Framework Convention but also in terms of national policies and global responses to climate change will evolve. The Secretary General of the United Nations has invited world leaders next year to a climate change summit in New York. We are working towards 2015 when the world will once again come together to try and see if our response can be commensurate to what the science is telling us. Your work as the IPCC and the world's attention that you will have over the coming months as you release the reports will in part determine whether that response will be commensurate with the needs of the planet. I therefore wish you, both in terms of the meeting being hosted by the Governor of Sweden this week, but also in the forthcoming weeks and months as the IPCC produces its reports, that you will be able to address both the urgent need for the world to better understand what is happening, but in particular to also understand that the multiple benefits of responding to the climate change phenomenon also holds great promise for the transition towards a green economy, a more sustainable economy in the 21st century. Much of what is now become a necessity in terms of greenhouse gases and global warming can also produce many benefits in terms of jobs, new technologies, new markets and opportunities for our economies and societies. It is in this context that your work stands out as one of the foundations for international consensus building. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would now like to invite Mr. Haldor Torgarsson, Director for Implementation Strategy, to join us here on the podium to present a statement on behalf of Ms. Cristina Figueres, Executive Secretary of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Please, Haldor. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman, Minister, distinguished participants. I'm honored to address you uh, at this important juncture on behalf of the UN Climate Change Secretariat. To the scientists gathered here, please accept our heartfelt thanks for the service that you are providing to your fellow citizens and to the international community. I know for a fact that you burned the midnight oil to construct a coherent picture of what we now know of the inner workings of the climate system and how we humans are disrupting it. To the delegates from governments, I know that you will draw on your wisdom and exercise your best judgment as you move to exercising your responsibility of approving the summary for policymakers. The assessment that you have before you is without parallel in terms of the depth of the science and its specificity and resolution in space and time. The contribution of this working group to the AR5 goes further towards meeting the needs of the Climate Convention and its parties than other earlier assessments could attempt. But at the same time, greater focus of the international climate policy response has facilitated your efforts to make this report policy relevant. One manifestation of this greater focus is the internationally agreed upper limit of acceptable warming, currently set at two degrees. The advocacy of that limit and the process, progress in limiting warming is now undergoing in intergovernmental review to be concluded by 2015. Your efforts to align the presentation of the findings to that two degree limit are greatly appreciated. The relevant findings of the working group one will be presented to a structured expert dialogue that has been set up in the context of this review I just referred to during the upcoming session, its upcoming session in Warsaw in November. And we're working with the uh, Working Group 1 TSU to make this science policy exchange as effective as possible. I'm also very happy to uh, note that the chair of the panel will address the opening of the conference on its first day. Ladies and gentlemen, 
We know that the sum total of the efforts to limit warming will not add up to what is needed to bend the curve, and mankind is not on track to limit warming to two degrees. For that reason, parties agreed in Durban in 2011 to develop a new legal agreement under the Convention, applicable to all parties to be ad adopted in Paris towards the end of 2015. The core challenge for Paris is threefold, to achieve the requisite scale, speed, and strategic focus of the global response. Scale is needed because of the magnitude of the required transition. Speed is needed because of the inherent inertia in the climate system and the time needed for policies to deliver desired results. And strategic focus is needed because of the long-term nature of the problem. In other words, the Paris Agreement needs to be anchored in the current reality, but at the same time be capable of transforming that reality. It needs to chart a viable global pathway out of the danger zone mankind finds itself in at the moment. The efforts to craft a meaningful agreement in Paris will gain momentum from the full picture of the science, both on the problem and on the solutions as the full AR5 unfolds. The contribution of Working Group 1 to the AR5 provides a firm foundation for that global pathway. In that context, the attempt to relate global mean temperature increase to cumulative total global greenhouse CO2 emissions is particularly helpful. It provides scientific underpinnings for collective management of the remaining available emissions budget. Dear friends, let me conclude by turning to what, when all is said and done, will truly determine the impact of this assessment, namely the effective and timely communication of the findings in a simple language, in the spirit of Einstein's appeal, which has been, was recalled by Thomas just a moment ago. And, and we must have been having similar thoughts, Thomas, you and I. Um, I was inspired by that same quote. The effort of applying knowledge, however, the effort to apply knowledge to decision making can't be seen as the responsibility of scientists alone. This takes partnership and should be seen as a collective responsibility of the scientific and the climate policy communities at all levels, domestic, regional, and international. I wish you all, your best, all the best in your endeavors, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Haldor, for your kind words. And uh, we are now all looking forward to listen uh, to the speech by Her Excellency Ms. Lena Ek, Minister for the Environment of Sweden, and she's delivering this speech also on behalf of the host country. Please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, co-chairs, delegates, ladies and gentlemen. A warm welcome to Stockholm. It's an honor to host the IPCC delegation here again. And you're right in the midst of the city, on the other side of the water of the stream. You have the town hall where the Nobel banquet takes place. You have the, the prime minister's office right over there. You have the parliament and the king's castle. And of course, you have the department of, en of environment right in front of you. Uh, you're meeting in classical grounds. Last year, we celebrated the 40 years, 40th anniversary of the legendary, Stock, legendary Stockholm Conference right here in these premises. Now, let me first start by expressing my admiration for your work. More than 1,000 scientists working together, voluntary, to give the world one scientific message on climate change. 
and also how we can tackle it. Uh, this enormous challenge addresses poverty reduction, security globally, and uh, better health for millions of people. And it's easy to understand why you earned the Nobel Prize. I know you all work patient, patiently, meticulously, uh, in accordance to stringent scientific rules. I just wish that those who question climate science would follow the scientific rules as well. I know you yet have to finalize the report. However, as I understand it, you basically will tell us again that we are facing one of the most threatening global challenges in history. It happens already, and it's man-made. Only this time, the IPCC is even more certain than 2007. The con consequences for humanity and the planet are serious enough at the current temperature increase. One example is the melting Arctic ice, so Arctic summer ice. Time is running out for the two degree target. Instead, our current emission trends basically correspond with the most catastrophic scenarios. But I'm an optimist, and I hope that people around the world will focus their attention and actions upon this scenario that corresponds to a good chance of meeting the two-degree target. Let me just, by these pictures, illustrate that we already see the effect in the Nordic countries. Here, we have a beautiful glacier called Brixdalsbreen uh, in Norway that has collapsed in the last decade. You see the situation in 1999 and you see 2011. The effects will be severe in our part of the world as well. For instance, flooding is already increasing in, in intensity. And we have another picture of a town, just, uh, this is Mälaren, the sea Mälaren outside, and Örebro is the very west area, west part of Mälaren, and this is a worst case scenario of flooding. And this is not seawater, this is an internal, is an internal land lake. So, um, looking at possible future flooding scenarios, like here in the city of Örebro, should make every decision maker aware of the seriousness of the situation. Thank you, we could take it. Firstly, climate change is a key challenge of our time. I'm truly encouraged by the many people around the world who take action and see the many benefits of climate action. As an optimist, I tend to focus upon the things that go in the right direction and that the report will bring about a race to the top around the globe. Secondly, it's imperative to make sure that the fifth assessment reports informs in a timely manner the ongoing negotiations towards a new global climate agreement to be decided already by 2015. And this would be a decision taken in world record time, if we can make it. So we need all the best input you can give us. Thirdly, the report is key to the message of urgency out to decision makers and citizens around the globe. The challenge is to convey the information in a way that is comprehensible for people in their everyday life and that really spurs action. Lastly, tackling climate change is of economic concern and even an opportunity or a provision for sustainable growth. Much actually happens to combat climate change. In Sweden, we've taken action since the early 90s and have a steadily growing environmental technology sector. Sweden's emissions has dropped by 20% since 1990, while GDP at the same time has risen by 60% during the very same period. We have used market-based policy levers, 
such as carbon dioxide tax and electricity certificate systems, and Sweden's share of renewable energies in relation to final energy system use amount, energy use amounts to nearly 50%. And in the heating sector, the fossils are almost out. The government's vision, also endorsed by the parliament, is that Sweden should have no net emissions of greenhouse gases by 2050. And one priority to reach that vision is to have a vehicle fleet independent of fossils, fossil fuels by 2030. The aim is to make it easy and economically advantageous to act climate smart and to really use benefits of action. Internationally, we realize that the UNFCCC is the crucial. In addition, we're working with initiatives that compl complement the ongoing work under the UNFCCC. For instance, Clean Air Coalition to Reduce Short-Lived Climate Pollutants, CCAC, and Friends of Fossil Fuel Subsidy Reform. And together with, eight, with seven other governments, we will launch an, a new initiative tomorrow, a benefits of action called the New Climate Economy in New York. And Finally, putting our act together, I wish you so much good luck with your work, and I do hope that you wish us policymakers the same. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you very Thank you very much, Minister, for these clear words, which for the first time I've actually seen supported by visuals, which I think were very instructive. Thank you very much for that. And this concludes the opening ceremony of the 12th session of the Working Group 1 um, 12th session. Uh, I would uh, announce a 10-minute break now, which gives us time to rearrange here the podium. I would also like to ask the delegates to remain seated and we would uh, reconvene here and start our discussion in 10 minutes. Thank you very much. And there are some additional messages by our conference organizer, Francis. We also would like to ask, of course, uh, the media to leave because what will follow uh, in 10 minutes will be a closed meeting. Thank you very much. <laughs>